Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and you're very welcome to our Angel Investing Southeast uh, Showcase. Uh, my name is uh, Aidan Sean, I'm CEO of Southeast BIC, and we manage the, the Halo Business Angel Network here in, in the Southeast. And uh, today we're going to focus very much on the activities of the Halo Business Angel Network, not only here in the Southeast, but across the, the island of, of Ireland. Uh, today we have a, a particular focus on the on the angel side and I'll explain later the, the, the operational overview of, of HBAN and how we link companies and angels. But today we just want to shine a light on the on the angel side of, of the process and how we engage with, with business angels who want to invest in, in opportunities both here in, in the region and at an all island at an all island level. So today, just a quick uh, overview of, of our agenda, and we, and we promise to get everybody uh, finished uh, in an hour. We're going to stick to that as, as best we can. Um, so I'll just give a quick overview of the Halo Business Angel Network and, and what we do and how we work. Um, and then we're delighted to have Aidan O'Driscoll from, from HBAN, who's going to give an overview of the due diligence process. And this is the a very important part of the whole um, process in investing in startups and with angels and it's often something that uh, particularly is important for new angels how to go about the due diligence process how do you evaluate the opportunity that is presented to you um, and after that we will have a, a panel discussion uh, from three perspectives so we're delighted to have a very uh, distinguished panel with us today we have Cara Fitzpatrick uh, who's an angel investor John Duggan from Lonet, an investee company that we had the Southeast Business Angel Network invested in last year, and Aidan O'Driscoll from HBAN and Iris Investments. Um, just a quick uh, bio of each of our, of our speakers. Uh, Carol, as well as being a, uh, an active investor, is the managing director of, of Chevron Training and Recruitment uh, and CEO of Bricks for, for Kids Ireland. He's also a past president of Wexford Chamber of Commerce. And a lot of you might know Carol as well. He presents Business Matters, the, the Southeast Radio's flagship business program where he uh, provides a platform to, to meet with leading business figures from across the country in both the public and, and private sector. Um, Aidan um, has spent the last 25 years in the technology sector, both in an executive and consultancy role. Um, he has spent the last number of years uh, as working as an independent consultant, working with companies in setting and implementing their strategic direction in the area of sales, marketing, finance, and strategic management. He's also a founding uh, member of Iris Investments is the Halo Business Angel Network coordinator for the Southwest region and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in, in Ireland. And last and not least, we have from the, the investee and the startup perspective, we have John Duggan. John is the CEO and co-founder of Loanit, one of Ireland's largest and fastest growing credit intermediaries with international expansion plans for, for 2021 and, and beyond that it, this company delivers efficiency and simplicity to the consumer finance credit application process. The company is, is based in Kilkenny, has seen rapid growth, I think currently employing 16 people. And last year, the Southeast Business uh, Angel Network, along with Enterprise Ireland, invested 570,000 euro uh, in, in the startup. So what I'll do for the next, just for the next few minutes is just set the scene in terms of what uh, the Halo Business Angel Network does who we are and how we how we operate but the context first of all is with southeast big so we manage the halo business angel network here in in our particular region and it dovetails very nicely with the work we do with startups so we work uh, getting high potential startups uh, in a very close relationship with enterprise ireland investor ready so all our consultancy work with our client companies is getting them to that investor ready in the stage be that public investment or private investment so we're a not-for-profit organization, part of a network of four BICs uh, in Ireland. So we're here in the Southeast, Cork BIC, West BIC in Galway and, and Dublin BIC. And we all undertake that same kind of role, getting companies uh, investor ready through intensive, customized, tailor-made, uh, one-to-one interaction with, with our clients. So that's just a bit of background on, on the BIC and where we kind of fit in. So with all this talk of, of, of angel investors and angel investments, I say, what, what exactly is an angel investor? And when I was looking it up, the term angel first appeared back uh, in, the, in the last century. It referred to wealthy individuals in, in the Broadway theatre community who would step in to save a production from closing its doors if it had a, a slow start or wasn't as popular as, 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 as it thought it would be. 
And that's where the term uh, angel uh, derived from. In modern day parlance, it's anyone who invests his or her money in a startup company, uh, usually for, for equity. And we can talk about the, the ins and outs of that later on in, in the panel discussion, no doubt. So that's just to kind of set the scene of what an angel investor is. Uh, the Halo Business Angel Network itself, we're, we're a trusted network for, for business angels. We match investors with high quality, pre-screened, early stage, scalable companies. So all the companies have gone through a process with us in terms of getting them ready to, to, to get that investment from, from, the, from the angels. Uh, HBAN is managed by Dublin BIC in partnership with the regional Irish BICs in Cork, Galway and here in the Southeast and with Clarendon fund managers in Northern Ireland. So the, the network covers all of the, the, the island of, of Ireland and that provides a great opportunity to, in, to interconnect the startups with angels right across the island and also angels across the island with, with startups here in the Southeast as well. And the network is a joint initiative and funded by Enterprise Ireland, Intertrade Ireland and Invest Northern Ireland. So um, currently the services to the companies and the angels, um, depending on which group you're in, I suppose, is, uh, without getting too technical about it, uh, we don't charge a finder's fee or a get a percentage of the deals uh, in working with the companies and, and engaging with the, with the angels. So we've been operating since uh, 2007, 2008, and in that time, have been involved in 576 deals and 125 million has been invested by our angels in, in these startups. So not an insignificant uh, amount of money. So again, just I suppose this, to reiterate what I've said previously, this shows the geographical coverage. So the BICs work, as I said, very closely with ambitious startups and are an ideal conduit for uh, putting these companies in front of uh, angel investors in that we will already have done a lot of the, the groundwork with these companies in terms of a robust business plan, uh, looking at their financials to make sure they're robust and, and stands, uh, stand up to scrutiny so that when we put them in front of angels, they have been well prepared. So it, it does, I suppose, take out some of that initial due diligence from, uh, from work that needs to be done by, by the angels. So if they are... So typically, I think uh, nationally or all, on an all-island basis, HBAN would see uh, up to 700 uh, inquiries a year, uh, shortlisting that to maybe 150, and then 60 deals would, would be done. So you can see that the, the screening process is, is pretty robust. Um, so what we try to do um, is we are a, a trusted network for business angels. So our side of the deal is that we uh, pre-screen, we do some uh, initial work with these, with these companies and then put them in front of the angels who can make up their own mind. Ultimately, it is, it is uh, their own decision whether to invest or, or not. So as I said, we don't, we don't take a fee for our services and we, we do not take equity stakes ourselves in, in the business. Um, and then we are, see ourselves very much part of a wide ecosystem and work with a broad range of parties to source deal flow and deliver value. So we're part of the European Business Angel Network. And as I said, our partners, Enterprise Ireland, Intertrade Ireland, and Invest Northern Ireland work very closely with us in uh, building and maintaining this network of business angels uh, on, on the island. Um, and this is, again, was something we will talk about later, no doubt, in the panel. So as I said, we're, to some people, we're like a, a dating agency. We, we bring together the startups and the, the angel investors. Um, the ideal relationship is one that has a, a divorce planned for a five or seven years time that P, uh, the angels can exit with a return on their investment and that the companies have reached a, a, such a scale that they can uh, either be acquired or sell their business so that everybody is happy. So that's the ultimate goal, that the investment is made so that there is uh, some sight of a return or a potential return from, from the outset. In terms of how we're, we're structured, as you can see there from, from the map, and actually there's one in the southwest that's missing there, I didn't update it, um, the, the, the Kerry Business Angel Network was, is, is a recent, recently addition to our, to our structure. Um, so, as I said, we have a pretty broad sweep across the whole island and how we are structured. Uh, some are informal gatherings uh, here much in the southeast. It's, it's a group of individuals who want to 
invest in companies and, and they come together and invest as they did in London last year. Others are more formally structured into syndicates. Um, so a syndicate is, it invests as, as that particular syndicate into, uh, into a, a startup. And some of those syndicates uh, are generalist syndicates and others are, are very specific in the types of companies they like to invest in. So you see there the likes of Bloom and Boole are, are into uh, technology, IT type investments, Iris on the, the MedTech life sciences. Then you have food, MedTech, the West by Northwest is a, a generalist one, I think as well. And then ourselves, part of what we do is, uh, on a syndicate basis, we're very much more uh, a generalist and look at opportunities in a broad sectoral sweep across the, across the region. And I would hasten to add our investors in, in the Southeast, while they, might state a preference to invest in Southeast companies. It's not exclusively so. They look at opportunities as as they arise, and likewise, our Southeast companies are based in the Southeast. Would also get opportunities to pitch to these other syndicates and other groups as well to uh, fill out an investment round. Just to give an idea of of some of the sectors, um, in twenty twenty, the two big sectors were were ICT and medtech and life sciences. Uh, but as I said, here in the Southeast, we take a, a broader view and we look at opportunities uh, as long as they're uh, good opportunities in, the, in a broad sweep of sectors. So we would see some food and ag tech as well. Um, if you look at the left hand side there, you can see some of the breakdown, the 576 deals to date. The angel investment of 125 million is really, really important. And an angel investment, hopefully we'll talk about it in a while, is not just about the money. Uh, it's all about maybe contacts and knowledge and skills and experience that angels can bring as well. And also angel investment can often leverage other funding from public, um, like Enterprise Ireland, HPSU, Money High Potential Startup Investment, or other seed funds can also come on board uh, because the companies have raised that money from, from, the, from the angels. And one thing to note as well is that um, the, tip, the average individual investment uh, by angels is, is oh, just north of, of 50,000. So what we're seeing is uh, angels are spreading the risk amongst a number of, of startups rather than putting all their money onto one particular startup. So they're spreading their, their money around a number of, of startups. So we're seeing lots of deals where ind individual angels are maybe putting in 50, 70 or 100K um, into, into startups and the, the accumulated investment then can rise and be significant um, around that. So in some respects, that's part of the education process we have been undertaking with angels over the last number of years to say, look, yeah, do spread your risk uh, if, if at all possible and build a portfolio. Um, just a, 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 some interesting stats there, just to follow on from that. Um, internationally, the Angel Capital Association you can see that broadly speaking, yeah, we're in line with what's happening internationally and that the interest there in, in software technology and medtech is largely mirrored here in, in Ireland as well. Um, and again, just to show where angels like to invest. So you can see there that typically um, angels are investing at the earlier stage of, of a startup's development and in the, in the seed round phase where companies are, are raising you know, half a million, 750,000 euro. Um, that's where typically, the, that's the sweet spot where, where angels like to, like to invest. So the average round size uh, in the Halo Business Angel Network in 2019 was, was 260,000. But that varies significantly. Again, just to continue the theme of how early um, uh, angels uh, typically uh, invest, um, so they, they tend to invest early in the revenue cycle of a startup's growth. So uh, typically there you can see the vast majority okay. that, that angel investors are, uh, the, the startups are still, um, uh, they're, they're, they have revenue, but they're, they're still at that scaling phase. And that's where angels like to, like to get in. Um, again, again, they're just, just reiterating there that it's early days. The, the companies are typically small. A lot of the angel investment we would see part of the investment would be used to um, hire key individuals uh, uh, to, to bolster the team that will deliver the business plan uh, that outlines that opportunity for, for the angels. And just one stat there, and something we're, we're always trying to grow, um, the, the 
the female companies that uh, the H band is investing 22%. I think of another slide on this actually. Yeah. So uh, eight, eight and a half percent is very precise of our current uh, angel cohort are, are female. It's something we're trying to trying to improve and encourage more uh, female angels to get involved with our network. Um, 11 percent of our deals in 2020 had female investors involved, which is which is great. Uh, we'd like to do more, of course. And on the company side, 22% of the investee companies had female founders or co-founders. So that's something um, we're, we're act actively trying to encourage is increased female participation, both on the startup side and definitely on the angel side. And how we, how we interact and how we get the angels in front of our, of our companies. Um, and I'm almost loath to, to say it because it's TV and all the rest of it, but it's like a Dragon's Den uh, type scenario. Um, no cameras, of course, it's invite only. Um, so typically we would have four companies pitch to a panel of our investors, a 10 minute pitch. And there's an opportunity for the angels to have an initial Q&A with the investors. And after that, then they can either meet as a, as a group if they have an interest in a particular company or um, meet with the companies individually and start that due diligence process. Um, and that's how we kind of interact. When we, when we meet with angels for the first time, we try to get a feeling for what, number one, what types of companies they're, they're interested in investing, how much they would like to invest. And again, it's not, we're not asking you to, to, to lodge a, a, an amount of money into a bank account to guarantee it. Uh, so it's, it's, we don't, there's no money up front or anything like that. It's just to get a feel for how uh, and, and what type of companies you'd like to invest in, how much you'd like to invest, and what involvement you'd like, what your experience and skills are, um, and also how you'd like to interact with us in, in HBAN. So some of our angels attend all the forums, and we would encourage everybody to do that. Uh, others have very specific requirements and say, Aiden, if somebody in the ag tech space, for example, comes across your desk, I'd like to know about it and we can uh, interact directly with, with you then uh, on that particular startup. So it's very flexible in how we engage with the, with the, with the angel investors and how they want to be approached. Um, so as long as, um, as long as we can get that introduction, we don't care how we do it, whether it's a formal via the, the pitching sessions or informally via referral, we're, we're happy to facilitate that. Uh, I forgot to mention as well that the, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, please keep your uh, keep those questions uh, coming and um, we can deal with them directly to the panel if you like during the panel discussion or keep them for the, the formal Q&A session afterwards. So we'd encourage you to, um, to keep those questions uh, coming. So hopefully Aidan is here at this stage, is he? Apologies for that, Aidan. No worries. How are you, Aidan? Very well, thank you. Do you do you have a presentation? I do, yeah. Yo, I so I share my screen. Yeah. Um, and it is. Uh, so as I said, for a lot of for a lot of new investors, this is part of the process that kind of frightens them. So we talked today, as 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 an introductory session to angel investing, that this would be a very useful topic. And Aidan has years and years of experience uh, in this, both in HBAN and in and in Iris around uh, due diligence and how angels um, typically go through that process. So are you happy enough to, to go on, Aidan? Yeah, I'm okay, yeah. Cool. My Thanks screen for there for people to see. Yep, looks good. Thanks, Aidan. Okay, no problem. So basically, going back to Aidan's point there, the way we start in this is that we normally get, um, before we start the due diligence, we have the, a company meeting and whereby we, we see the full investor presentation. Normally, most syndicates have a, a subcommittee that we set up to look at any potential investments, and we would look at that uh, amongst our group. We screen these opportunities as we see them, and then we bring them in front of the syndicates. And they do normally we give, as I, in the syndicate that I'm involved with, there is we give a 30 minute presentation to the companies. And we, at that stage, at that meeting, we, we have a poll amongst our members and we make a decision as to whether we go ahead and uh, do due diligence or not. The whole process uh, when we come up with the company is that we look at the pre-money proposed by the company. And now with the amount of investments that are happening, 
and particularly the ones that I'm involved in in life sciences, but it's coming more prevalent that there are more and more deals are being shared between syndicates, um, between syndicates and private individuals and between syndicates and VCs are a combination of the whole lot. So to share the load, what we normally do is that we come together as co-investors and we figure out who does what. So who has the expertise? Who can go and look at specific areas, whether it be in the IP, the sales, or whatever it may be? And if we don't have that skill set, and in some cases we come up against very complicated, unusual areas that we wouldn't be, have the expertise amongst our members, we hire independent people to come in to do that. The lead investor, who obviously is the person with the most money investing, normally co coordinates all of this. And we pull all of our resources together and say, look, there's no point in having four or five legal firms representing us all. We'll have one legal firm. We will agree the costs up front with, with the legal firm. We will agree what we consider to be a reasonable uh, pre-money. We will agree how we're going to invest. Are we going to invest by way of convertible loan note, ordinary shares, preference shares, or a combination of all of that? And we then look at what we see, what the fully diluted cap table would be. So we take what the promoter and his existing investors are. We look at the pre-money. We look at what we're investing for. We Normally, we insist on an option pool. And from that, we get end up with a fully diluted table. So we end up and say, look, this is what percentage we are going to end up with. And from that, and from that meeting, we issue, which is the most important document, is we have a DD questionnaire that we give out to the company. Now, the DD questionnaire, excuse me, I'm having problems with my mouse. Uh, so the, the, the DD questionnaire is, is very, very detailed. And the whole idea is, is that we're asking the company to declare for us everything that we should look at if we're prior to we invest. In most startups, most of it will not be um, applicable because they wouldn't be, they won't have been trading at this stage. But certain areas are important, and I've highlighted and read what those areas are. That is, we need to look at the corporate legal structure. We need to see who, who owns what. I mean, there was one particular company that we looked at. And when we got their cap table and we went well down the due diligence, and then we checked it to the CRO and we discovered there was one additional shareholder that was not on the list given to us um, for a particular reason for the company, but it was a reason that we then pulled out as a result. So this is detailed. It forces the company to set up all of these things. And what, what we ask them to do is that under all of these headings, prepare all of this information and we want you to set it up in the data room. So typically we have a Dropbox or equivalent. Into that goes all the documents that support the DD questionnaire. If they require an NDA, we, we should do that. And all of the investors who are involved look for full access and access. And once we have that access, we, review all this documentation as part of our due diligence. And there are constant moving of, of documents. So rev iteration is very important because if you're looking at a financial spreadsheet and there's five or six different very, uh, iterations, then it's very important that we can see the sequence of events. From that um, data room, uh, we, we have, the business plan and the business plan is what the company is going to deliver up for the next three to five years. It's, it will become an integral part of the shareholders agreement. It will come part of the warranties that will be required and it must cover all aspects of the business. So initially, you know, you, you, you get the presentation, you get the investor deck, but this is the detail. And this is the detail that we see that we need. And for this to go through all of this, we then get the companies to warrant that what they've given us is correct. And that all of the information allows us to go ahead and see where the company is going and what funding they will require up until the exit. 
an area that's normally um, not looked at and something that we do uh, now, put a lot of time and effort, is into the personnel. The personnel that who are there today, and then the, we look for an org chart and ask for, okay, we want to see where you are in three years. This is the money that we're now investing that will take you on the journey for three years. And we need to see who will be the people that you, you have today and who you propose to hire. To look, we need to look at the employment contracts, especially with regard to IP and non-compete, which we require, but then we look for existing um, proposed salary packages. And this is where we've come up uh, lately a lot of companies come to us and they have bonuses built in, they have pensions built in. And this is not what we are investing in. We are investing in a short journey, three to five years. We expect the promoters to be on a similar journey as us. And we are not into big salaries uh, and lifestyle companies. So the, the, the reward for everybody is the exit. It's the exit. And that's where we all make our money. So we try and limit the cost of the promoters and any senior executives in the company. We compare that to other startups. And we also do a very detailed check on the promoter's background. We look for references. We look for where they worked previously. And we speak to other people that have been involved with them in the past. So another area that takes up a lot of our time is the IP. And again, we look to see, has the company a plan in place, a strategy as to what they're doing with their IP, what they have today, or how they plan to strengthen that IP over the next number of years. We hire, in most cases, a patent consultant to review the IP. And we also look at it whereby if the IP is assigned from a university, what are the terms and conditions? Is there a right of assignment? What's the royalty, et cetera? And obviously we would like to see the ability that, that any company that we invest in, that the title to the IP is clean. And that when it comes to a sale, it is a straightforward assignment over of the IP. And in some cases we ask for freedom to operate um, by going, asking the company to go out, talk to an independent um, patent lawyer and get a freedom to operate that the, the IP is clean. Next area that, which is more or less straightforward is the detailed financials. Um, again, here we go into the, the detail of what, what assumptions are being used with regards to sales, um, margin analysis, salaries, re a detailed review of the overheads and see where those overheads come from and how they were calculated. In most situations, we, we find that people underestimate the journey and people underestimate the costs. Subsequently, there's, a, there's always going to be a cash shortfall. So the amount of effort and time we put into the financials tries to suss this out. We try to look at it at the business plan and look at the financials and we'd say, okay, let's cut the sales by 50%. Let's leave the overheads. Then let's see how long the company would survive. We try to encourage companies to have a buffer of at least nine to 12 months cash. So it's very important that the time and effort is put into the financials and that the financials are not just prepared by a, a firm of accountants on data given by the company. They need to be detailed and assumptions need to be stressed and that is a lot of the work that we do in our dd again with regard to sales and marketing again it is looking at how they're going to go to the market this is direct sales will it be distribution who are the competitors look at those look at their websites look at the margins they make look at how long is their journey has been to date? How much have they raised? Compare that to what our promoter is looking to do. And why would their journey be different to the competitors? Stress that. And also then go out and talk to customers. Find out, is there a need for this product? Will they pay for it? With again, with the product, 
It is looking at where the product is at. It's talking to the potential manufacturers, looking at the whole regulatory path. So again, there is an immense amount of work to be done here with, with like similar other areas of the DD is looking at the product, looking at the bills of materials, looking at the costings, looking at how long it would take them to subcontract it out and work with other um, manufacturers. We have situations where people have magnificent plans until then they start running three, six, nine months behind because the subcontractor cannot meet the requirements. The, technic the technical details are too intense for them. So again, the journey has to be worked out. We need to look at building in delays, building in delays into their milestones that they're planning to do. Similarly, we look for the exit strategy, how they plan to do that. They need to look at other companies in their sector. If they can do that, look at the valuations they got, look at the total funding they have received to date, and then we look at what is our return. 80% of all startups fail. 10% lifestyle, 10% really make it. For us to get our money back, we need to make six to seven times our investment, a minimum. So that's what we have to build into the exit valuation. Compare that to the pre-money, look at the journey, look at what we will end up with fully diluted and see can we achieve that. So finally, when we've all of this done, we prepare our DD report. We include any independent work that we've done, by, we've asked other people to do on our behalf. And since we're not all syndicates, and this is very, we are not uh, institutions that give professional advice. We're not regulated and we stay away from that. So what we do is we give our members the ability to read that document, make up their own minds, once that happens, and then we have sufficient in individuals to make up the total value, what we then do is we issue the draft sheet to the promoters. And the term sheet, in most cases now, we try to put into the term sheet all the issues that we think will cause problems. So that before we go to the legals, the, in the promoters of the company have the opportunity to look at the term sheet and say, okay, what do you mean by down round? What do you mean by restrictive transactions? What do you mean by reverse vesting? You're investing via, what is the difference between ordinary shares, preference shares? This is your pre-money, understand that. So we go through all of this in, 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 in a lot of detail with the promoters so that when we go to legals, these issues are, are ironed out and no costs are incurred, which has happened in the past where people say, fine, we, there's a term sheet, there's the pre-money, we want 10% of the company, now let's give it to the legals. And then all of these issues come up, which can delay considerably getting to the final stage. Okay, Aidan. Brilliant. Thanks, Aiden. <laughs> it's like Aiden to Aiden. Thanks a million. That 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 it, there, there's so much in it, but it's such a, a useful kind of uh, insight into the mind of the the investor on the investor side. What are they looking for? How do they evaluate? How do they critique a potential uh, in, investment? So that's that's brilliant, Aiden. And I'm sure there'll be some questions on that later. So you can leave your camera and mic on there, Aiden. And I'd invite John and Carl now to turn on their mics and camera till we get the panel discussion how are you guys yeah good thanks good um carol i'll go straight in with yourself right as as the as the uh, an angel investor on the panel and you know you're you're a busy guy with your other business interests uh, and all the rest of it what 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 was the motivation to get involved in angel investing well i always attended the great british business show in the uk and every year at that, I saw that they had an Angels Den section initiative running from that particular show. And I remember Aidan coming back from one of those shows back around 2013, 2014, and giving you a call. 
because I was involved in the organizing of the Wexford Business Export Show, the Wexford Chamber of Commerce at the time. And I thought it would have been a nice bolt on to that particular event. And you and I had a number of conversations and we agreed that it would be a great initiative. So you brought a number of angel investors to Wexford back then and we built it into the overall expo and it really went down a treat. And I got a first hand insight into how angel investing worked back then and had a chat to some of the angels that were there on the day as well. And I was very impressed by their experience of the entire process. And afterwards, I remember having a conversation with yourself about going down and seeing some of the investor forums and to see how they worked. And once I went down, I was absolutely hooked based on that and based on seeing the services that were being provided by CBAN as a result of that. I suppose as somebody that has grown a business to 80 staff in Wexford, and I've done it by bootstrapping the business along the way. We never went out looking for external funding, and it's probably a regret in hindsight that I have, because I think that if I went down that road, we probably would have business now with over 200 staff today. And I suppose the company itself is a very strong corporate social responsibility ethos and culture built into it. And one of the pillars of that is about how we can support the next generation of entrepreneurs. So CBAN allows us to do that very, very easily. Okay, brilliant. And 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 I, I'll get back to you, Clark, because I have tons of questions for you on the, on the angel side. But just to bring John in at, at, at this point, and and John, when when like you're still a relatively young startup, you know, accelerating uh, growth, you know, at a, at a pace. But what what was the what prompted you to say, God, we need investment? And number two, what prompted you to say, okay, we need angel investment? What, what was, the, what was the, the thought process there? And what was the interaction like then with the, with the angels and the process? Yeah. Um, what prompted us to, to seek investment was, was uh, a focus on growth, like accelerating growth. Um, when you have a vision of what you're trying to do and, and you're on any project or a startup, every startup needs funding. Um, Aiden made uh, reference to the fact of, of having that, um, that cash flow to, to achieve what you're trying to do. If you have a good growth plan, um, then you, you, need, you need the funding to go along with it. Um, as regards the reason for um, coming to, to the HBAN, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an evolution. It's the first part of that journey. Um, it really is like it, it, it's, it's the first step for um, no matter where, whether it be Ireland or America, or you look anywhere or in any format, whether it be Dragon's Den, everyone, all, all startups at some point will seek angel investment. Um, and the HBAN just provides, and, and True Civic provides a, a perfect route to that for us. But it's just, it's, it's, it's on every path for, for every startup. And John, you know, based on what Aidan O'Driscoll just said there on the due diligence, was that your experience of it in terms of engaging with the angels and the questions they were asking and the probing and the length yeah, of time? Yeah, no, absolutely. Took- absolutely. He's actually made me very nervous because um, I'm just, I'm, I'm remembering that we're, 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 we're planning on our Series A at the end of the year. So I'm just going to go, oh God, I have to go <laughs> through all that again. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I mean, and, and, and rightly so. Um, like as I said, I, I think you you uh, uh, said at the at the outset, it it's a marriage. It it is no one. Um, you know, it, it, you have to find you for both for a, an investor. You have to be passionate about what you're investing in. Um, but from from a, a, a and the due diligence around that, you have to make sure that the company, the founders, are robust. Realistically, I think it's something that I've 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 come to. We were speaking about it earlier before we came on that I I do think that. The most important part of any startup or, or, or to make them investable at the start is the founders um, like you're investing because of a, an idea um, uh, like a, a good founders can take a bad idea and make it a business um, so you're really you're really investing in the founders strong founders like at loan it we're all ex-bankers um, you know and 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 that we, we understand our, our industry our domain knowledge is second to none which makes us it makes us able to to challenge the market and 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 revolutionize what we're trying to do. That's hugely important. Okay. And and I, I do I do remember when you pitched to C band last year and, and Carl and the other investors at that forum, that was very quickly apparent that the, some of the immediate feedback was uh, about the team and that phrase that domain knowledge really shone through. And I think it's it kind of sets the bar uh, that there's 
immediate trust level being built there, I think. And that's true to say, Carl, is the importance of the of the promoters uh, from, from early doors, isn't it? It's all about the team. Ultimately, as John said, you know, an average team can make a great business, but it doesn't work the other way around, unfortunately. So certainly when I'm looking at a business, it's the team first and foremost is what I'm looking at. Then from there, I'm looking at the service or the product and how innovative and how novel that is and what type of a sustainable, unique selling point it has. And then from there to look at the plan, especially the market entry plan and the sales and marketing side of that plan in terms of how it's going to be implemented. And then of course, ultimately it's all about the exit as Aidan said, and about achieving that trade sale so we can get a return on the investment. And, and Aidan, if I can come, come to you with your, with your H-band hat on for a moment. Angel investors, what kind of people are they? Who, who are you looking for to be, uh, what makes a good angel investor? What is there a typical profile? Is there a typical age bracket? Or what, what, what are we looking for when we're looking for a good business angel? Well, they're typically gray haired like myself, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so we would like to see a younger, a younger profile. They're normally people who've been successful in business either whether they have built and sold their own business or they're currently running their own business. They have a desire normally to invest in their own area. I think most angel investors invest within the 50 kilometer, uh, maybe a hundred kilometer uh, area of where they live. Um, so what, what you're really looking for is somebody who has done it already and has a desire to go out and help a company and obviously to make money for the individual as well. But I think there is a desire there amongst a lot of individuals to help companies to grow and to, to be part of that journey with the company mm. and, to help them along the, and to help them along the way. And I think one of the things that is very important that, that the investors put somebody on the board and that board is the communicator back to the inv investor group but more importantly, comes a mentor for the individuals uh, who are running the company, because a lot of companies don't have that expertise on the board, and they need to get that at an early stage. And and Aiden, if there, you know, people on on the on, on the webinar this morning, if they're if they're thinking about angel investing and looking at this, uh, you know, what you know, other than obviously we're going to say join something like like HBAN, but the advantages of joining of a formal network like HBAN to particularly new investors who are new to the game are there's a lot of advantages to doing that isn't there oh there's huge advantages because number one you spread your financial risk so instead of investing a hundred thousand you may over a period of time you may invest twenty thousand in, in five different companies secondly you also have other people that are soundboard who have expertise in certain areas so you give you the assurance that they've looked at it you know, they may have IP expertise, expertise, they may be in the sales side or financial side. So you have that sharing of resources amongst people. Thirdly, you share the costs. So your legal costs are down considerably. Um, and then, you know, you share in the upside with the investors and look at other new opportunities that that will come along in the future. So it's, it's a club. Effectively, that's what it is. And it, it is... I think Aiden, when you and I looked at this many years ago, we were involved, angel investing was very, very small in Ireland. It is now the biggest investment group. We out invest VCs, venture capital companies and banks won't go near startups. So we're the only source of seed funding for these companies. So I think we've become a very powerful tool over the years. And with the number of syndicates around the country, that's just getting stronger and stronger. And, and Carl, to go back to you again on the on the angel side. What is, is there? Is there sectors, particular sectors you're looking at, or do you have? Um, is there a kind of a, a maximum? You'll, you'll, without getting too personal about it, do you have? Are you managing a portfolio currently? And say, well, I have I have, I have a big pot here, and I'm going to spread that pot around. Are you managing a portfolio? And is there particular sectors that you're kind of looking at? Well, I, I think to answer that question, maybe I'll start by just talking about my own philosophy around money. Yeah. And when I look at money, first and foremost, I'm looking at three types of money. I'm saying, first of all, earned money, which is a salary or a wage or a dividend that you're getting from your own company. 
Secondly, you're looking at portfolio-based income, which is brought about by assets such as property or shares. And then the third aspect of it is passive income. So I'm involved in a number of franchises. So I have the franchise rights from a number of US brands in Ireland. So I categorize that as passive income in that regard. It's as close to passive income as I can get. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that's my philosophy on money first and foremost. Then I suppose in terms of sectors, the main sector I'm involved in myself is e-learning. So it's tech-based. So I would have an affinity to tech-based businesses first and foremost. So anything around the software space, I'd be open to looking at. And I suppose it's important to say as well, the businesses that I'm not interested in looking at are those that are very technical businesses. So those that are scientific with a lot of technical expertise required and a lot of the main knowledge and expertise required to actually understand the business model and how the market and sector operates. So there are businesses that I stay away from. That answers the question, Ed. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Carol. And John, back over to you again. Um, you know, you, you've got the investment, right? You, you've, you've, you've done it last year. You, you raised money from, from Angels and from, from Enterprise Ireland. What, what's the relationship afterwards? And I'm not looking at how good or bad it is, but what, what technically is the relationship afterwards with the, with the investors? <laughs> yeah. And, and how, does, how does that work? Just to explain to both maybe companies that are on the call and to uh, potentially yeah. that are listening in as well. How does that work for the, from your perspective on the company side? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're lucky, I guess. We, we've never had to report back bad news because of our, our, uh, our continuous expansion and, and rapid growth. So that's, that obviously helps the relationship for, for sure. Um, but um, yeah, as part of the agreement um, w w with, the, uh, with the syndicate, they're, they're, they have a member which sits on, on our board, um, which is great, to be honest, because it gives great visibility um, and it helps to communicate back feedback on how the company is progressing what the big and to be involved in the decisions as well um so it, it it's uh it's good visibility for the in investor for the lead investor to then subsequently feedback to the um to 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 the group um and it works very well like it, it, it's not as i said we're in a i don't know how unique a position but we're, we're in a, a stage of, of of rapid expansion and and all very positive so um but 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 all in all it works very well to have that visibility for the syndicate yeah, and I think that's an important point as well for both companies that are listening, maybe, and for, for angels that are looking in, is that you can, uh, like on your particular deal, there was a number of angels involved, but there was a lead investor appointed and you dealt with that in investor and they fed back into that other group. So that's important to, for people to, to realize as well. And Aidan, the whole, you, you went in detail there uh, with, on the due diligence process. Is, is it a case how many how many deals are fall away during that DD process? It, it's a lot of work to engage and start that that process, and it could end up with with not that something arises during that due diligence process. Um, it has to be done. But is, is there a big fallout rate at the due diligence phase? No, not not particularly. Even though saying that we were gazumped there recently. Um, but, you know, we went down the whole road, we term sheet, and then um, the company went away and was, were negotiating with somebody else in parallel, even though they had signed with us to say they weren't going to negotiate during that 60-day period. Mm -hmm. So, but no, most most of uh, the DD that we, we engage does lead to a, an offer on the table. Okay. Now, sometimes that offer may not be accepted, but all the other terms and conditions and all the good work done and the report, all of that has been done. Then there may be a final question over what the pre-money is. And that may be an issue at the very end. Okay, and we have a question about the pre-money that I get to the way. But so are you I, so before you engage in that detailed formal DD process, then is it a case that the pitch has gone well, you've got a good gut feeling, and then you, you proceed and well, I think a lot. What a lot of the syndicates we're we're doing now is that we're screening the companies beforehand before we bring them to the to the wider syndicate audience, so we know a lot about them. Then, obviously, we have the presentation that to do on the day, and then we would do some preliminary work as well. So, yes, there is way more knowledge about the company and about the industry that they're in, the sector, and so yes, they're definitely um, that reduces the risk and element involved okay okay thanks Aiden. i'm just looking at my, my clock here and, and i know there's people in the background going aiden 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 
Carol, and what what do you think? You know, we've come through one of the, probably the weirdest phases in, in in history in terms of the pandemic, and we're still we're still in it. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And um, what what's your expectation? Let's say as as a businessman in 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 the region and as an investor maybe in in the in the region in, in startups. What what do you feel is likely to happen uh, in in the coming months and years post pandemic? Well, I are you, think are you, are you are you full of of hope and and positivity about everything? Well, my own business Chevron doubled in size during COVID, so it's a technology based business. So it's one of those ones that was very, you know, I suppose got the benefits of the pandemic for whatever benefits there were from it. And that seems to be continuing. Uh, but look, we are looking at uh, acquisitions. And in fact, we, we just secured a deal last Friday on buying a training provider uh, that does a lot of business with government, has a number of government contracts. So whilst my outlook is bright for the next three years in business, I'm also hedging my bets by looking at government contracts and trying to secure those. And, and we're in the middle of tendering for some of those as we speak. And also looking at buying up other training providers that have multi-annual government contracts so we can in some respect hedge our bets and protect ourselves against any volatility that will be in the market over the coming years i suppose but i am very excited uh, by one development in the southeast that i think is going to have a major positive impact on deal flows and new startups coming down the track and that's the establishment of the technological university for the southeast of course, we've been without a university in the Southeast forever. I think that that has impacted uh, the number of startups that have been created in the Southeast right across the region over the years. But I am very positive in terms of what this technological university will do to be able to speed that process up and to be able to have a very positive impact on the number of new startups that will be coming down the track. Okay. And you're, you're actively... Uh, looking at opportunities as an investor as well. You're looking forward to some good opportunities arising in, in the coming months and years, yeah? Yes, we, we absolutely are, both here in Ireland and also overseas. We're, we're on an acquisition pad at the moment. Uh, we bought an English language school in Carlow back in December last. We've just done a deal on a, on a training provider now that uh, turns over about 3 million a year. And we're also in the process of buying other providers across the country as well. And hopefully we'll have another two deals done by the end of the year. Uh, but, but as I say, the providers that we're looking at buying now are government contract holders, multi-annual government contract holders. That's the sweet spot of provider we're looking to buy uh, because we want to hedge our bets against any, any volatility in the market over the years ahead. Brilliant. Thanks, Carol. And, and Aidan, just a final question for yourself. You know, uh, let's say, you know, during the during pandemic, we're, we're hopefully coming out. What, what's your thoughts on the whole uh, in angel investment scene in Ireland currently in a healthy place? I think it's in a very healthy place. I think I think we are seeing more opportunities, um, very good opportunities. I think the whole angel network is working well. I think HPAN has put together all of these syndicates, and I think that is creating awareness for an awful lot of people that there is a body out there that they can invest in. And there are lots and lots of opportunities out there. There's no doubt about it. So I think it's in a very good place. And also the fact that minus interest negative rates helps as well. Absolutely, um, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Better place to put you. John, the last question to yourself. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier there, Lonet is, is growing, scaling rapidly, and, and you're looking at a, a further Series A round maybe later in the year. Does, does that fill you with, with excitement or, or dread, knowing how you know, relatively difficult it was? And, and let, let no under and illusions here, securing investment is, is a difficult task, and you came through it successfully, as I mm. said, a strong team, strong proposition. So are you excited or in, in dread of, of, of raising the, the next round? And, and did you learn anything from, from the first round, as it were? Um, ah, no, no, look, I, I, I joke about the fact that it brings me anxiety when Aidan mentions the, 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 the due diligence, but um, the reality is, as an entrepreneur and as someone who's, or, or, as a company, we're on a, we're trying to start a revolution in, in the banking industry, and that brings great excitement every day I get up, you know, that's the reason I get out of bed, and um, as, a, as a founder, as an entrepreneur, that's, that's why you do it. 
Um, we're on an exciting journey. We've just opened in the UK. You know, there's it's all positive things, and it's it's very exciting. So, um, yeah, the, there's uh, it's 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 not the dread, but uh, yeah, no, we do have plans at the the end of the year to bring around uh, to to raise for a Series A as well. And um, and again, that's that's just even a, again showing the in quite a quick amount of time the evolution of our company and a return for 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 the um, for the angel investors as well to see that growth quickly and to see VCs contacting us now continuously looking to to bring us to the next step, which is what you want to see if you're an early stage investor. No, absolutely. I'm sure Carl and the other investors are delighted to hear of of, of the the success and best of luck with, with the with the rest of the journey, John. Uh, Aidan and Carl, thank you so much uh, for being part of the panel today. Absolutely brilliant. As usual, time just kind of creeps up on us here. Um, I think we have we have time for for a few questions that can, came in there. I'm just looking. Um, e, there's this question of which syndicate is investing in the energy sector. I don't think there's any specific one. I think um, it, the various groups and syndicates, uh, unless they're a specialist syndicate, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at, at at opportunity. So you can contact us there. Uh, is there a minimum amount of investment required to become an angel investor, uh, Aidan? No, there isn't really. Should no, no, there isn't. No. But typically, I think the minimum amount would be probably about ten to twenty thousand would be normally the normal amount. Exactly. Yeah, and and that's and that's the way angel investing has gone. I think partly through our education process, we were telling uh, investors, new investors, and you know, spread that risk spread around. So we're seeing investments now um, across. As you said, if you had a hundred, don't put it all on one one bet. Put maybe four twenty fives or two fifties, and, and that's the way to do it. Um, a very detailed question here, well, a technical question. How do Iris usually approach reverse vesting? Reverse vesting is a very um, emotional subject when it comes to promoters and uh, investors when they're sitting down. The logic behind it is this, is that the investors invest in the company and we're investing in the promoters. And it goes back to what John said earlier. It is a team. It's the team we're investing, it's the people. And we want them to stay that journey. So typically reverse vesting is normally for a three or a four year period. And what we say to, to, to companies is that individuals, that if you want to leave that journey, then you're going to have to give back a portion of your shares. And it depends if you're a good lever or a bad lever. If you're a bad lever, then the shares come in at a nominal value. If you're a good lever to come in at fair value, which would normally be the last round. But what we want to do is to make sure that the promoters last the journey with us. Um, and it is a very controversial one. It causes a lot of problems. But from our point of view, it is trying to get the team to stay together. Okay, cool. Um, we have a question here from Ken. Pre-money is confusing for me. Company estimates company estimates valuation of the valuation of company but the return for the investor is not commensurate with risk how can we get realistic pre-money valuation versus company's opinion of their potential i suppose aiden again like that's that's the old that that's the common argument. how long is a piece of string yeah um, how do you value a company yeah. you know you can get accountants and come in they'll do fancy spreadsheets and go out with discount cash flows for years it's a buyer and a seller's market. I, that's the way I look at it. If a, if a promoter can come in and can sit down and justify his pre-money by showing what he will sell this company for down the road and what typical buyer will pay it, and this is the return I'm giving to you as an investor. If that can be shown and, you can, and it can be convincing, then that is the case. Mm -hmm. But the other side to it is that there's most inside an all shareholders agreement now, there is a down round protection. So if somebody comes in at two, and if the valuation is too high and they subsequently raise money at a lower valuation, then the promoter um, gets severely diluted. So it's in the promoter's interest to look at the end journey and what the valuation will be at exit and what is acceptable to the promoter as a reward for its, uh, their time and effort. So, and, and I hasten to add as well, Aidan, that, I mean, Dragon's Den has done a lot of positive stuff around this area, but negatively as well some of the you know the the equity offers on things like dragon's den it's not it's not that in real life you know not at all pathetic not, it's gonna i mean i think most of those 
companies in Dragon's Den. I don't think any, I think only about 10% of them get funding in afterwards. Absolutely. We're just going to finish up quickly here now. The, uh, any, what is the realistic annualized rate of return for a portfolio of angel investments? Aidan, Carol. And oh, that's a realistic return. Yeah, it's, it's. I think if anybody would achieve in the region of between 15 and 20%. Yeah. I think that's that's what you'd be looking for. Cool. Um, what would be the maximum investment size? I mean, there's you know we'll we'll, we'll take if you've got money to invest, we'll we'll we'll, we'll put it to good use. <laughs> we have individuals who who have invested up to a quarter of a million as part of a deal that we maybe have done a two million deal. Yeah. yeah so it very, and some people who have invested. 400k into one. Yeah. Into yeah, so it, it varies. And I think that's what people need to understand. Syndicates are not funds. Yeah. It's a group made up of a group of individuals who come together and then they have their own agreement within that as to how they operate. Yeah. So I think HBAN is very well structured now. Yeah. And there's a lot of templates there on the HBAN.org site that talks about, you know, um, templates for investing in templates for DD, templates for preference shares, ordinary shares, etc. So we have now the infrastructure in place. Ed, and I think it's important as well to make a note about and to, to make the point about risk minimization as part of this all this entire process for an investor. To be fair to see, Ban, you do a lot of work in relation to this in terms of pre-screening the companies that come before you. Uh, you have a lot of market intelligence and you have a lot of experience of meeting founders and startup entrepreneurs along the way in terms of the type of person that has some chance of success with a startup business based on their passion and work ethic and vision and everything else that goes with that. But of course, apart from that, if you can invest in a company that has already been screened by Enterprise Ireland and is a high potential startup client of theirs, uh, which means that of course, any investment that comes in from HBAN will be matched by Enterprise Ireland. So that's, that's useful in terms of minimizing risk and in addition to that, then, of course, and it shouldn't be overlooked either in terms of tax relief, in terms of the tax write-off option as well to the Employment Investment Incentive Scheme to the Revenue Commissioners. And then, again, that's another way to be able to de-risk as much as possible some of these investments. And just to go back to an earlier point there that you spoke to Aidan about in terms of the pre-money piece, I think that the, the more letters of intent uh, that you know, a startup entrepreneur can come into the CBAN forum with, you know, the more convincing it will be that a market exists for their product or service and to be able to get the support from the investor, investors at that stage. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl. Um, so look, that's it. Um, if, you, if you want more information, you know, log on to southeastspeak.ie or hband.org. We'll be in contact with, with those who, who registered here this morning as well and follow up. And just to, just to mention as well that our next investor forum, our next pitching event, it's invite only, I hasten to add, but companies will pitch to our, to our angel investors is on June 22nd. So any investors out there who might like to come along, uh, no strings attached and have a look and observe and see how this works, you're more than welcome to come along and have a look at that. Uh, no pressure, uh, just to come along and, and have a look and we'll be in touch with you during the week anyway uh, uh, about this. So I'd just like to thank John, Carl and, and Aidan. Thank you so much for giving up your time today. Uh, really invaluable uh, insights from, from all aspects of, of HBAN and how we work. Uh, it's been fascinating. And I said I'd love to spend more time talking to you, but thank you very much indeed. Thanks to everybody who, who logged on this morning. Um, and we nearly got you with the hour. Apologies, we're five minutes late, but there and done. Uh, a quick thanks um, and a heartfelt thanks to the, to the team behind uh, Siobhan, uh, Rosemary and, and Cormac as well. Thanks guys for putting this, uh, this together. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much, guys, and talk to you all very soon. Cheers. Bye-bye.